Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And we are blessed that you can join us for this time in God's Word. I say hi. <laughs> Having a good time? Well, praise God. I hope we all have a good time. Amen. Hallelujah. Because the Word of Get God. Into the Word. Okay. Can we distract it already? But John the Baptist said that his joy was made full because he heard the voice of the bridegroom. May our joy be made full because we hear the voice of the bridegroom, the oh, Lord Jesus Christ, yes. during this time of our study. Because it's important, not that you hear me or Alice or Mark, it's important that you hear from the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, but you need to hear it from God. Because that's when it gets real. That's Hallelujah. Right. All right, so we're continuing on in our study in 1 Timothy. And we're in chap chapter 5. We ended up last week in chapter 5. Uh, and we had talked about, I read verses 17 and 18, but we really didn't get into that. So I want to, I want to spend a little time in recapping that before we go on today. And uh, go on, we will. Yes, we will. Right at the mark. Praise and ask God blessing on our time. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for your word, and we're here to study it today. And, Lord, we're here just for one or two reasons. One, to renew our mind with your word and to fall more in love with it in our heart. And we just thank you that your word is never changing and it's a rock that we can stand on and rely upon. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Rock that is higher than I. Amen. amen. I can say amen to that prayer. Hallelujah. All right. As I said, we're going to start at uh, 1 Timothy 5. Verses 17 and 18 is what I'm going to read right now. Okay. <clears throat> the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And as I said last week, and I just wanted to go over this, mm -hmm. the issue is about ruling well, rule well. Not it, lording over. Well, no, because, see, in, in the world... In most general usage, when you talk about somebody ruling, you're talking about somebody being superior, mm -hmm. somebody being preeminent, somebody being dominant, uh, to exercise authority or dominion or sovereignty, to dominate. Well, you know, that's not the way it's supposed to be here in the church of Jesus Christ, because Jesus clearly taught. And I'm going to read Mark 10, verses 42 to 45. Calling them, the apostles, to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great, great among you, shall become, if you want to become great among you, he said, shall be your servant. Amen. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So ruling in the body of Christ, it doesn't have the same connotation at all as it does out in the world, because we are called to serve, right? Our lives are about service. The elders who rule well are to teach and to show by their example the whole correctly divided word of God. They are to be committed to feeding the sheep and to be on guard against the predators. Certainly not to be the predators. Amen. Yes. But unfortunately, through the ages, mm -hmm. that seems to have always been the case for a certain portion, okay, of the right. quote unquote leaders. I mean, think about the fact that way back in the time of Jeremiah, right? Just at the time of the Babylonian captivity was going to take place. Mm -hmm. God spoke through him and said, Woe to the shepherds yes. who are destroying and scattering my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are, are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 1 and 2. They were being the predators, not protecting, as shepherds are supposed to do, protecting, right? 
And then in Ezekiel, I mean, just got by the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? That was Jeremiah, now God speaks through Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. And Ezekiel says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep and without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains on, and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. Mm. Well, you know what? That sounds like today. <laughs> it, it, is, it is like today. I mean, uh, whether it's worse or better... Mm. Remains to be seen. However, having said that, when Jesus was asked by his disciples about what would be the signs of his coming in the end of the age, you know, if you read Matthew 24, you'll see that expressly that the worst part of that is the false teachers, the false prophets, the false Christs. Mm -hmm. And they're self-serving. Yes. They're not there to, to serve. They're there to be served. So... Who, if, if it says the worker is worthy of his wages, mm -hmm. and it does, right? Yes. Who and what determines what those wages are? God. Well, God should. Um, I mean, you know, it's not, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. I was going to say it's not up to us to judge. Well, in a sense, it is, and I'll mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. that. But so many preachers today are living like billionaires, mm -hmm. worldly billionaires. Um, they will they will have to answer to, to the Lord for what they do. Yes. But when I see, particularly we spent time in Africa, and when I see pastors living like millionaires, billionaires, and the flock just destitute, if I, I, it doesn't make me happy. Mm -mm. And I think that I am working in the mind of Christ. It can't make him happy, all right? I'm sure it makes them sick to start. Well, let me, let me start with this observation, okay? This is from Matthew 9. I'm going to read verses 36 through 38. It says, Seeing the people, he, talking about Jesus, felt compassion for them because they were dispersed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. To send out workers, laborers, the King James says, right? Not managers and CEOs, workers, not bosses. That's right. You know, we live here at the moment in Florida, and Florida was much more in the past uh, a place where you saw a lot of migrant laborers, mm -hmm. okay? Because it is not the... It is not the uh, same as it was a number of years ago where half of Central Florida, half it's of Florida orange was all groves. orange groves yeah. and they would have workers come in. When, More uh, agricultural right. than it is now. And, and for example, uh, when we lived in South Florida, we saw there's an area down there where they grow a lot of sugar cane. And when it was time for the harvest of sugar cane, they would bring workers in from the, the Caribbean, from mm -hmm. especially from Jamaica, and they would work there. Those were migrant laborers. I think, and typically... I mean, these are not highly respected people. Okay, these are not the bankers. These are not the lawyers. These are not the, the highly respected. These are people that work, and it's hard labor. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they get paid low wages as a rule. And typically, they may not even have their own homes to live in. No. They would be provided with places to live and then charged for them yes. while they were working. They were enslaved. But is that not the call of God? on ministers, to be migrant laborers, mm -hmm. to go where he calls you to, to, to harvest. Like I said, it's looking, he's looking for the laborers. He's looking for the workers. I, I think we've kind of flipped this upside down, okay, and being guided by worldly things rather than by the word of God. 
So here's some more of Paul's teaching and Paul's attitude. In 1 Corinthians 9, 11, 12, he says, If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we re reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? And then in the Galatians 6, 6, he says, The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. And then 1 Corinthians 9 again, it says, if others share this right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. How much should it be? Well, it, it should be a living wage where, you know, enough to, enough to meet the needs. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know that that entails having some of the wealth that they have, okay? Uh -huh. You know, let me tell you what Peter said. And think about this. Listen to this and think about this. Okay. Peter said, in 1 Peter 5, he said, Therefore I, ex I ex exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Mm -hmm. You don't do it for the money. No. <clears throat> and it's not a job. There's a difference between a calling, a vocation, and going out looking for a job. A lot of the ministers or so-called ministers of the gospel today are indeed a hindrance to the gospel because they're more concerned about their wages than they are about the sheep. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. So we're going to come back to that, um, particularly as Paul gets into this further in the next chapter, in chapter 6. Right, so I'm going to go on and read verses 19 and 20 now, right? Mm -hmm. First Timothy 5, 19 and 20. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. But the thing that's interesting, it doesn't say don't accuse. It says don't receive an accusation. Okay, except on two or three witnesses. Right. I want to tell you something. This is I we used to teach this in the schools that we started. We used to teach the kids. It is as bad. It is as evil. It is as sinful to receive gossip yes. as it is to give gossip. Mm -hmm. What What did you call them? If they sewer were... suckers. Right. <laughs> Because that's what it is. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you take it, it's like going to a sewer with a big, long straw and sucking on it. It's because it, it's filth. It is. It's interesting that the instruction, like I said, is against receiving it. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Okay, it talk, talks about if they continue in sin, right? There's a process. Mm -hmm. yes. If somebody is, if you, if somebody is sinning. There is a process to deal with it, right? It says, it says, if your brother sins, go to him and him alone and show him his fault. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Mm -hmm. Go to him. This is in Matthew 18. This is Jesus talking, right? Not, if you see something wrong, I got to tell you the truth. I mean, a lot of people leave a service on Sunday. And the first thing they do is start ripping at the at the pastor in his sermon or you know if you got a problem go to him if you got a problem with anybody go to them before you go to don't anybody. go to any don't go to anybody else and start talking about it that's sin yes. s i n sin oh that's capital s capital i capital n sin all right exclamation so so you go to him and you go to him alone and you you i don't want to even use the word confront you make him aware of the problem because hopefully what he's going to do is be get the witness of the spirit mm -hmm. and repent of it. Mm -hmm. But if he does not listen to you, it continues, Jesus continues, right. take one or two more with you mm -hmm. so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Right. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. It's Matthew 18, 15 to 17. 
This is serious stuff. Very serious. It's life and death stuff. But there is a process that you're supposed to follow. And I don't think that process is followed. No, because it's a lot easier. If I see somebody do something wrong, it's a lot easier for me to tell. If I see Steve doing something wrong, it's a lot easier for me to tell Ralph. Right. Than it is to tell Steve. Because Steve may react. Hmm. You know what? It's if Ralph would get in the habit of reacting and saying, Why are you telling me this? Why are you telling me this for? Go to him. That's right. Maybe that would change it, right? So we're supposed to rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest will be fearful of sinning. That's what it says in the verse we read, right? Mm -hmm. But you'll hear, my brother, you're being judgmental. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're supposed no. to be. Touch not my anointed, the, the, those people will say, right? Are you supposed to be judgmental? Yes. Yes? Yes. Alice says you are. <laughs> Well, she happens to be in agreement with the Apostle Paul. That's right. Said, because the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, and this, this is the word of God, right? But actually, I wrote to you, because he was saying, when I wrote to you not to judge. I didn't mean the He said, I, I mean, don't judge the outsiders. God's going to take care of them, yes. right? But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. If he is an immoral person or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? Mm -hmm. sick. But those who are outside, God judges. This is the word of God. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Yes. The church has tolerated too many false preachers, teachers, and prophets. For all too long. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the letters that Jesus sends to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, what does he say? He says, I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Mm -hmm. There is a verse in the gospel somewhere that says, um, don't judge the least you Lest be judged, unless you be judged. But then, and I'm always getting that thrown in my face, but I always tell them, read that verse in context, because the next one says, in the way that you judge, you shall be judged. And the next verse says, in the way that you judge. It's telling me in the next verse that I do judge. According to the word. To the word. Yeah. We are not the standard. Our feelings are not the no, standard. It's by not us. It is the it's word of God. Yeah. And that's why in correction, you must always correct in love with, with the, the word. word of God. Because you've got to show somebody that what they're doing is wrong according to the word, not according to the way you think or the way you feel. So when it says don't judge, it's saying don't judge by your standards, right. but by God's standards. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. And... I mean, the scripture is clear. Mm -hmm. We are to judge. We are to deal. We are to be responsible to deal with the error in the church. And we're not doing a good job of that. No, no, no. So if you remove the wicked man from among you, mm -hmm. you know what you're going to see? You're going to see a deterrent to sin. Yes. yes. Okay, there's not much of a deterrent. People can get away with all this without any consequence until the consequence comes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the next verse, in 521, Paul continues and he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit, in a spirit of partiality. All right. It's not about the way you, it's not about, you can't be partial yeah. without, you got to do this without bias. Remember Peter when he was up on the roof, right? And he gets, God sends him out to, to go to Cornelius' house. Mm -hmm. It says in Acts 10, 34, that opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Mm. In the King James, it says he's no respecter of persons. Mm. Or like Paul wrote to the Romans, for there is no partiality with God in Romans 2, 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. And to the Corinthians, he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, he said, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ among according to the flesh, yet now we know him in no way, in this way no longer. You know what? We're too impressed with people. Yes, yes. 
You know, if you were to meet, I don't know, pick somebody, the mayor of your town, the governor of your state, if you were to meet the president, how overwhelmed would you be by the presence today? Well, let me tell you, you shouldn't be overwhelmed at all. Mm -hmm. Not if you are in the habit of being in the presence of the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth all the time. The King of Kings. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Because if you are conscious of the fact that you are spending time constantly Jesus. with him, no man's going to impress you. Mm -hmm. What did the angel Gabriel say? He said, hello. <laughs> he also I said, stand in the I presence. stand in the presence uh, of God. That's, he's talking about when he announced the birth of, of John the Baptist to his father. And there, when, when his father had trouble believing that, he yes. said, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. Ezekiel, by the way, said the same thing. Yes. When he went up to the, to the mountain, he said, you know, he, he stood in the presence of God. Mm. That, that's an amazing thing. When you're mm. conscious of the presence of God, I promise you, what well, you still, you know, you're supposed to honor, to give honor to whom right, honor is right. due, and you're supposed to be respectful. Right. But That's you know, right. it's and like you're not supposed to be swooned. If you're if you're the best friend, and now this is a bad analogy, particularly at this time, but but if you're the best friend of the president president of the United States, you know, meeting the county dog catcher is not going to impress you mm. because he's got a title on a business card. Right. Okay. And by the same token, if you're in the if you're in the habit of walking hand in hand day by day with the King of Kings, the president's not going to impress you either. No, absolutely not. Okay, but what he's saying here, because God's no respecter of persons and we're supposed to do this without bias, nobody is above the law. Nobody is above the word. Right. Nobody gets a pass. We are all bound by no, the same word. All no right? partiality. No partiality. And it's sad to see so many prominent, well-known preachers who have fallen into sin mm -hmm. and have been called to task either by the church or, or worse yet, by the world. Yeah. Okay? Because the church didn't do it. And that's so, so all too often too true in these days, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's even worse to see so many who continue in sin and are not called to task mm -hmm. by the church. Mm -hmm. Romans 2, I'm going to read Romans 2, verses 19 to 24. Listen to this and think about this. And he starts by saying, he's talking about if you're, if you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, he's speaking to the church leaders, right? Mm -hmm. A light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Mm -hmm. You who preach it, that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, though you're breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Don't give the devil an opportunity to blaspheme God. Because, no. It happens so often. Hear, hear the cry of Isaiah so long ago when he said, Awake, awake. Clothe yourself in strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer come into you. Isaiah 50. God's going to clean this up. I'll tell you what. Listen for the sounds of hoofbeats in the sky. He's coming to clean it up. Hayom Yahweh. Hayom Yahweh. Uh, a while back, you had problems with identity theft, and God told you, you think you've got problems with identity theft. And uh, imagine what I go through, because people have identified with God, and they have misrepresented God well, through what they do. And you have to realize where that's coming from. Satan, I mean, this is a picture of Satan in Isaiah 14 when he said that he would make himself like, like the most, most high God. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's going to ascend to heaven. He's going to make himself like God. He's a counterfeiter. And by the way, there's a difference between trying to imitate God mm -hmm. uh, and, and being a counterfeiter of God, right? 
Right. There's a big difference. Yeah. <clears throat> Paul, Paul, in the New American Standard, Paul says, be an imitator of me even as I am of Christ. King James says follower. The word imitator is a much better translation because mm-hmm. the Greek word there, um, and I can't even pronounce the Greek word at the moment, but if you do a study, you'll find that it, it means to mimic. Yes. So Paul is saying mimic me. You know what that means? That means to imitate, be like him. Right. But you can, you know what, you can do that with a good heart to be a blessing, or you can do that with a bad heart. <clears throat> you can you can give love to somebody because they need love, or you can imitate that and give love to them to try and deceive them. It's, God searches the heart. Yes, he does. <clears throat> but we should be, as it says in Ephesians 5, 1, imitators of God. Satan is not an imitator of God. He's a counterfeiter of the God, of God and the things of God. Okay? Yes, he is. All right, let's just touch on verse 522. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. This brings me to the issue of ordination. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in the last week or so talking to a brother up in New York about uh, ordination because he's been asked to go and ordain some people. <clears throat> the dictionary says that to ordain is to invest with ministerial or sacerdotal functions, mm-hmm. confer holy orders upon somebody, or to select for or appoint to an office. These definitions all too often fail to demonstrate that it is not the church that is to invest, confer, or select, but rather to recognize who the Lord has chosen, called, and appointed. Ordination is, we don't give power to that person, but we recognize God has given power and authority recognize and, the calling and, and equip God, them. Yeah. Okay, the calling that God has on that life. It's, it, and this is—it's rare to find this in the church. I mean, it's like ordination. Okay, we're giving you the power. No, you're not. Mm-mm. We're recognizing what God has done in your life. We're recognizing God's call on and in your life. That's what it is. That's interesting because it all has to deal with authority. Of course, it does. Mm-hmm. Does the authority come from the church or did the authority come? That's from the God? point. That's exactly the point. That's why we need to—we need to understand that because we're. By and large. Now, I, I have done ordinations yes. here in the States, overseas, I mean, mm-hmm. but that's what I do. I mean, first of all, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to be involved in an ordination of somebody if I have, if I don't know them personally, right. have not sat with them and that talked is, with them, right. that I feel comfortable that, yes, this is God's call on their life. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we'll go through the procedure in, in, the, in the church to give them this ordination so that the church, the body of Christ, recognizes the ministry that this person's been called to. <clears throat> and having recognized it, they should then support it. Right. And when I say support it, I'm not just talking about feeding them money here. No, no. I'm talking about they should support it with prayer and encouragement. Right. Okay. That's what ordination is about. And you know what? This is really an important topic. And I'm, I'm out of time for this. Yeah. But I, we're going to come back to this next week, mm-hmm. and we're going to talk about the ins, the outs, the good and the bad about ordination. And by the way, you'll be interested to know that I think that every sweeper in every church building who is there because of God needs to be ordained. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, Jesus. that you do call us to serve you from the least to the greatest, Lord God, and that anybody who is serving you is doing a great, great work. Amen. All our desire is, Lord, that is at the end of the day, we will hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It is our desire to be pleasing to you, Lord. And we thank you that you equip us with your word, your spirit, your power. In Jesus' name. Well, be back for that part next week. Hallelujah. See you then. Bye.